Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today we have a practice question we'll be going through. Uh, we have a question related to the system interactions section on the exam. As you recall, in this podcast, we go through each of the systems on the FSBPT content outline. So just a reminder that FSBPT content outline, that's what dictates what is on the exam. And if you're curious how they develop the FSBPT content outline, well, it's via a practice analysis where they determine what an entry-level PT is required to know in the United States across all the jurisdictions. And so they do that full practice analysis, which involves going across the country, across the practice spectrum, in very diverse locations. They try to determine what it is that you need to know to enter the field and practice as a safe, direct, and effective PT. So today we'll be going through a practice question related to the system inter interactions. But before we do, just a quick reminder, it's not too late if you're looking to sign up for our robust VIP course. So the VIPT course, this is where we take you through all the content on the FSBPT content outline. It's done in a very systematic and organized way, takes you through all the content in and what I like to think of as ways that you can remember things, actually stick it for test day. Because let's be honest, there is a ton of content and you've got to get it in your mind for test day. So we go through all of that. We've got a, a full uh, exam simulator. Right now it has six exams. You get access to that. Plus our written material, a whole library of videos. We do twice a week sessions where we dissect practice questions in a real time live setting. So all of that, it becomes very clear, concise, and organized. And so if you're looking some, for something extremely robust that is often mimicked but never equaled, you'll find it in the VIPT program. All right, so today let's go ahead and dive into our practice questions. So on this section of the exam, you can expect somewhere between 8 and 12 questions. And a lot of it is related to that evaluation, differential diagnosis, and prognosis. So when you consider system interactions, we're talking about, like in our case here, we're going to be talking about diabetes. But other things would be, say, dementia or Alzheimer's disease related to hip fracture. You could see how that would incorporate multiple systems, say the neurosystem and the musculosystem. And that's the real key with system interactions is understanding the interplay between some of these things. So let's go ahead and dive into our practice question and we will talk about it. So as per our usual, I'll read you the question, give you a moment to respond, and then we'll talk together. A patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus it has recently begun a course of physical therapy to address generalized lower extremity weakness. While ambulating on a treadmill, the patient reports bilateral burning pain on the posterior aspect of the calf musculature that was not present at rest. At the termination of the ambulation, the patient reports the pain dissipates completely. Upon further examination, which of the following signs is most likely to be present? So again, we have a patient with type 1 diabetes that has recently begun a course of physical therapy to address generalized lower extremity weakness. While ambulating on a treadmill, the patient reports bilateral burning pain on the posterior aspect of the calf musculature that was not present at rest. At the termination of the, of the ambulation, the patient reports that the pain dissipates completely. Upon further examination, which of the following signs is most likely to be present? So one, blood glucose greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter. Two, decreased pedal pulses. Three, exacerbation with lumbar extension. And four, fruity acetone breath. So again, the answer options are blood glucose greater than 300, de decreased pedal pulses, exacerbation with lumbar extension, and fruity acetone breath. So in this question, the correct answer has to be related to what we see in the question. And the question is directly describing something called intermittent claudication. So intermittent claudication means that as you increase the cardiovascular workload, you have a, a decrease or I guess a, a deficit of blood flow to the working muscles. And so very often this occurs during ambulation or any type of, of upright activity, whether really some type of walking or running, something where the patient is not getting enough blood flow to the calf musculature. And again, that's related here to that bilateral sensation. So the bilateral pain sensation during cardiovascular workload, that's going to indicate some type of, of of claudication or intermittent claudication is what it's called. So this is, is related to peripheral arterial disease. This is extremely common in the case of type 1 diabetes. This is because just the mechanism of action with type 1 diabetes is that you can't process sugar very well, 
obviously because you don't have enough of uh, the in, enough insulin production from the pancreas. Therefore, it results in more fatty breakdowns and all that fatty breakdown either in, um, yeah, really all the fatty breakdown that creates the ketone bodies and all that starts to create atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic changes in the large blood vessels. So this happens in the heart too. So a person with type 1 diabetes has a much higher risk of coronary artery disease as well as peripheral arterial disease. So other things that you would observe in the case of someone who had peripheral arterial disease would include decreased or absent pedal pulses, impaired wound healing, poor tissue perfusion, and skin or nail changes, all of that related to that poor vascular perfusion. So the correct answer here, when we talk about someone who has pain during ambulation that dissipates completely with rest, that's going to be telling you, okay, likely to be intermittent claudication. Therefore, we would observe in the patient decreased pedal pulses. Or you could also, another potential correct answer option would have been the ankle brachial index being decreased because that's what is being tested with the ABI, the ankle brachial index, is the difference or disparity in blood pressure at the ankle as compared to the arm or the brachial blood pressure. So therefore, you'd see a decrease in ABI, you'd see a decrease in pedal pulses, especially, uh, really not, I guess not especially, but uh, yeah, the dorsalis pedis pulse, uh, all really any, any indicator of blood flow to the lower extremity, you'd probably see a decrease or a change in that regard. So the other incorrect answer options, so option one and four, which include blood glucose greater than 300, this is a sign of diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperglycemia to the point where diabetic ketoacidosis is very likely. So this is likely to result in that fruity acetone breath, uh, Kussmaul respirations or that rapid hyperpnea, flushed skin, lethargy. All of these are signs of hyperglycemia and none of that's mentioned in the question. So really we have no indicator that they would have either fruity acetone breath or a blood glucose greater than 300. None of that seems to be present. Now, if we wanted to change the question, have the question include uh, the patient is uh, has severe, uh, uh, let's see what, uh, high, uh, <laughs> blanking on the words here, but uh, if they have polydipsia, that's the word I'm after, if they have excessive thirst, uh, they have a fruity acetone breath, they have hyperpnea or deep, frequent deep breathing, all of that's gonna be indicating hyperglycemia. And if that was mentioned in the question, then you would start to suspect that the blood glucose was out of whack. Again, you have nothing here to indicate that you are in full-on hyperglycemia. Rather, the question is describing someone who has peripheral arterial disease. So you would expect to have decreased pedal pulses related to the intermittent claudication. And then finally, the last incorrect answer option is the exacerbation with lumbar extension. While it is true that there are some musculoskeletal changes and kyphosis that can occur, in the case of patients with type 1 diabetes, that would be more position-related pain rather than exercise-related pain. And the difference, what I'm driving at here, is that if you expected, if you expected position-related pain, that would be more related to stenosis of the and constriction of the the spinal nerve roots as they exit the intravertebral foramina. Again, that would have to be indicated in the question as having some type of position component. Again, this question doesn't describe any position, rather it only describes activity that either you begin activity, let's say you have no pain at rest, you begin activity, you have the pain, and then it goes away at rest again. That tells you that it has to be exercise related and we don't have any indicator that it is position related. So in that case, the, the spinal nerve root compression is unlikely. And so that's why option three, exacerbation of lumbar extension, is not the correct answer because that's not, that positional component is not being described in the question. So again, back to the correct answer, decreased pedal pulses, which has a strong correlation. So this is the cardiovascular and the metabolic and endocrine systems meeting together or interacting, meaning that di type one diabetes is likely to result in atherosclerosis of the large vessels, resulting in both coronary and peripheral arterial disease, which would then result in the claudication, the skin and nail changes, the absent or decreased pedal pulses, poor wound healing. You can see how there'd be a, a lot of crossover in the other systems, really all the systems with someone with type one diabetes and really type two kind of fits in this category as well, but type one especially fits in this category. 
All right, so there you go. There's the question for today. Kind of a fun system interactions question. Anyway, be sure to check out all the other episodes we have here on the podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a five-star review. It helps so much as we're trying to get the word out, get people over here on the podcast, PT final exam. So in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Keep a grin on your chin as you study. Remember, just remember, you're good at this and you like this. So even if you do have a rough day, just try to tell yourself that. Like, I chose this, I like it, and I'm good at it. And that'll help a lot. So I'll catch y'all in the next episode. Have a fabulous day, everyone. Will Crane fist bumps all around.